On March 26th, 1997, police discovered a grisly scene in the compound of Heaven's Gate, an apocalyptic sect who'd been around since the 1970s. The massive media frenzy that resulted would reveal a lot about American attitudes towards new religious movements, and along with a few other groups, Heaven's Gate would be instrumental in attaching modern negative perceptions to the word cult. Now this episode is going to cover some very difficult topics, including extreme self-harm, cancer, and mass suicide, so if you'd not, rather not hear about those topics at all, uh, we won't mind if you tune out and just join us for the next episode. For the rest of you, brace yourselves, because we're about to enter Heaven's Gate. We will be spending some time in this episode describing how Heaven's Gate justified and defended their own actions, and I'd like to make it clear that we as a podcast are not interested in justifying or trying to defend their actions, or in outright condemning any religion as right or wrong. And it's going to be a really tricky line to walk, um, and we're still new at this, so if you've got issues with how we're covering this story, please let us know politely and we'll try and address them. Our goal here is to talk about the history and to take a careful look at how this group saw themselves, how they understood and viewed the world, and how the world viewed them. I'm Patrick Reynolds. And I'm Michael Albany, and you're listening to Sex Ed. That's S-E-C-T-S Ed. So Heaven's Gate emerged from a number of different sources and religious traditions, and and it took a long time to fully coalesce into the state that they were in 1997. One thing that's often missed in the casual discussion of Heaven's Gate uh, is the fact that they were, and always considered themselves to be, Christians. Uh, The majority of their theology is lifted uh, pretty directly from a few different branches of Protestantism, and especially at the start of their beliefs uh, were mostly old-fashioned Protestant beliefs, with the cult leaders reframing these old ideas while using more science fiction-inspired metaphors. Before we start talking about the foundation of Heaven's Gate specifically, though, we need to talk about a category of beliefs known as UFO religions. These are defined as any religion that incorporates extraterrestrial entities and unidentified flying objects as elements of their belief system. In the late 1940s and into the 50s, as hopes and fears about new technology pervaded American society and the popularity of sci-fi as a genre exploded in film and television, the pseudoscience of UFOlogy took off in tandem. Reports of UFO encounters and alien abductions started uh, skyrocketing, and there is definitely a lot of back and forth as these UFO encounters uh, often sounded a lot like the plot of the latest sci-fi films that were out, and then sci-fi films started incorporating uh, these alien abduction stories. Uh, pretty soon into the 50s, you start getting religious groups in the U.S. and in Great Britain who take this new cultural obsession with UFOs and alien visitors and recontextualize existing religious beliefs to fit into these new sci-fi inspired views of the heavens. Um, this is when the first ancient alien theories start surfacing, which would later be a big part of the beliefs of Heaven's Gate. By the time Heaven's Gate started to come together, there were already dozens of these groups. And while UFO religions uh, specifically are groups who felt the need to make their belief in aliens into religious doctrine, even today, as many as 50% of Americans believe in the existence of intelligent alien life forms. So if you believed in these alien visitors, and you also believed in one of the more mainstream branches of American Christianity in the 50s, uh, it raised a lot of really major theological questions if you happen to care about that sort of thing. Do aliens have souls? Did God create them or did something else? If aliens are real and they're interfering with the earth uh, and the Bible is also true, why did the Bible never mention this at all? And then the people start coming to the conclusions of maybe it did and maybe all these things in the Bible that come down from the heavens, angels and such, are in fact aliens and they can sort of mesh the two beliefs that way. But for the most part, the vast majority of Christians in the U.S. in the 50s who believed in UFOs didn't really think about the contradiction or worry about it, even though um, especially more fundamentalist churches started coming out and saying, absolutely not, you cannot believe in our beliefs and also believe in aliens. But a lot of people who believed in both just kind of shrugged and went, meh, and believed in both anyway, which is something I'm always fascinated in with folk beliefs, which I'll talk a lot more in detail about if we ever cover spiritualism. But yeah, you get things like aliens, ghosts that in many ways clash or challenge core beliefs of a church and uh, people just kind of go, what? Eh. Um, some of the people who really could not let that point go though uh, were the founders of Heaven's Gate and that's Marshall Applewhite and Bonnie Nettles. So Marshall Applewhite was born in Texas in 1931, the son of a Presbyterian minister. And he was known for being uh, very religious, even as a child. And so uh, because he was raised in this Presbyterian tradition, it's probably important to go a bit into that uh, tradition that he was raised into. So Presbyterianism is a system of beliefs with its historical roots in Scotland. And really, if we want to talk about sort of the theological core of Presbyterianism, as 
as opposed to other Christian beliefs. One of the big parts about it is predestination. So as opposed to Catholicism, where your ability to ascend to heaven is based on your faith in God and doing good works, good works defined as the sacraments, uh, in Presbyterianism and other Protestant faiths, that good works component uh, really isn't a predominant factor. The faith is the important part because God has supposedly predestined you to whatever afterlife that you will eventually reach, whether you go to heaven or to hell. And so it's really upon the grace of God that your eventual fate is determined. There's also the authority of scriptures, as far as I've read, is, is a big deal. That authority doesn't come from the, the top down, the hierarchy of the church and the priests, as in Catholicism especially, but it's, it's your interpretation of the scriptures that's more important, right? Yeah, even in even in modern American Presbyterian churches, one of the ways you sort of see uh, that sort of centrality of the scriptures manifested is in sort of this decentralization of church authority. Uh, again, comparing it to the Catholic Church, where you have an established hierarchy of the Pope and then uh, cardinals and archbishops and bishops going all the way on down to priests. It's very established, very ingrained there, whereas for a Presbyterian church, that might not even be the case. You can have basically a Presbyterian church where the pastor of that particular parish uh, is able to exercise a degree of authority that really can sometimes even go against the sort of higher-ups in the church hierarchy. All of those factors carry over very heavily into Heaven's Gate. Uh, they keep a lot of the same beliefs that Marshall Applewhite grew up with, but just sort of twist the way that they describe them. The authority of the scriptures is still a huge deal for Heaven's Gate, and it's Applewhite and Nettles eventually. It's their interpretation of the scripture that gives them their authority. They're able to point to it and say, I'm this person, or I'm this person in the Bible, and I'm fulfilling this prophecy. But it's all very, very biblically inspired, and that's sort of the core. Uh, and then also, a huge deal for Heaven's Gate is going to be predestination and the, the concept of the elect, where the people who are going to hell and their vision, although they eventually move away from having a hell, the people who are not chosen um, for heaven, essentially, in their view, are already doomed. There's the elite, there's the chosen few who will get to accompany them. And what their kingdom of heaven is, is very different, but the core belief in predestination and the elect is maintained into heaven's gate. It's very interesting how the belief in predestination really colors the actions and activities of uh, various Protestant groups, uh, Presbyterians included, while they're on earth. Because you think about predestination, one of the things you think is, well, if my ultimate destiny, whether going to heaven or going to hell, is already predetermined, what sort of motivation do I have uh, to then be a good person here on earth? Uh, and really the motivation that you have is by uh, demonstrating an outward sense of piety that kind of signals to other people in your community that you are amongst the elect. So where this sort of comes into play is in the development of Protestant work ethic. So this idea that if you are a hard worker on earth, that's a sign that, okay, you have this sort of sense within you that maybe you are uh, imbued with the grace of God and there's good things ahead in your future. The reason we're talking all this uh, Presbyterian theology is because Marshall Applewhite uh, actually, when he grew up, went on to study theology in hopes of becoming a Presbyterian minister before switching his major and uh, studying musical theater instead. He got his master's degree from the University of Colorado, married a woman named Ann Pierce, and had two kids, and spent a few years trying to make it as a musician before eventually he became a music teacher at the University of Alabama. Uh, in 1965, he was discovered having an affair with one of his male students, so he lost his job, his wife left him, and he relocated to Texas for another music teaching job at the University of St. Thomas. And for a while there in Texas, he was openly gay, and at other times he claimed to be bisexual. But his homosexuality and his deeply held religious beliefs continued to cause him a lot of anxiety. By 1971, following the death of his father, he was in a very dark place. He was having uh, mental health problems. He resigned from his job, and he was in massive debt. 
Now, understandably, the sources get hazy around this point, but uh, somewhere around 1971, these are the darkest days of Applewhite's mental health problems, he met his soulmate, the co-founder of Heaven's Gate, a, a psychiatric nurse named Bonnie Nettles. Now, uh, a great deal has been written about Applewhite's mental illness uh, by various authorities, but it's important to note that we're not going to try uh, and diagnose him with anything specific because we don't actually know. After his death, uh, there were many people who came out of the woodwork to diagnose him with this uh, and that, but it seems like it comes down to we can't understand this tragedy, and it's really easy to just call him crazy. So for us uh, as third parties to try to retroactively diagnose him with anything specific, uh, we think that would be uh, irresponsible and unreasonable on our part. As you just mentioned, um, a lot of people did that immediately. That was, that was very, very common to say, oh, he was hearing voices and was schizophrenic, or oh, he was depressed, or oh, he was bipolar. Some of them were experts of their fields, but they didn't know him. It was just talking heads on the news, tossing out tons of ideas. He definitely did have mental health problems, but yeah, we don't know what specifically they were. And I think in thinking about that sort of dimension, the idea that immediately after a tragedy occurs, dozens of people come out of the woodwork. That is really uh, an endemic part of this story, this idea that this is how people of the community who were outsiders to this belief system, uh, this is how they reacted when this happened. So it's a part of the world viewing them. Uh, but while Nettles was a psychiatric nurse and Applewhite uh, did seek mental health treatment at various points in his life, uh, she was not as sometimes reported his nurse. Uh, whenever she and Applewhite uh, talk about the relationship, they tend to put it in terms of fate or grand destiny. And their family members have said that they uh, met at a play or randomly at some social event. Uh, regardless of how they actually met, their relationship itself becomes central to the beliefs of Heaven's Gate. So Bonnie Nettles was raised Baptist, but had really quickly rejected that religion, and for most of her life she had an obsession with a lot of folk beliefs and esoteric Christianity and a whole grab bag of uh, New Age beliefs. She was super interested in fortune-telling, astrology, and regularly hosted seances to communicate with ghosts. Applewhite talks about how they immediately felt a connection. Bonnie talks about how she'd done astrology readings. Uh, she wrote an astrology column in the local paper, and she claimed to have prophesized Applewhite's entry into her life. So when they met each other, she was expecting him or someone like him, and they very immediately developed a very strong relationship and were together almost constantly from that point on. And it was really, the relationship was based on their sh shared theological obsessions and uh, their, a lot of just research they were doing together. Now, Bonnie was married uh, with two children when she met Applewhite, but her marriage would fall apart due to how much time she was spending with him and the fact that she was starting to believe uh, she was in contact with the parted spirit of a medieval monk named Brother Francis. Once her marriage was over, she and Applewhite opened a bookstore together, and they essentially went full-time delving uh, very deeply into theological conversations. And at this point, Bonnie's beliefs in astrology and spirits uh, and a slew of other New Age practices combined with Applewhite's Presbyterian theology. Bonnie was particularly interested in prophecy and the Book of Revelations, and she and Applewhite spent a lot of time reading science fiction books by Arthur C. Clarke and Robert Heinlein, uh, and at the same time reading through the King James Bible, weaving the story uh, of their own lives and relationships into the context of biblical prophecies uh, that they came to think they were fulfilling. So they were slowly building up this elaborate mythology around themselves as God's elect, uh, and specifically as God's messengers from the book of Revelations. And they began to start publicly hinting to others about their status as divine messengers. And by the mid-1970s, they were just going into churches and proclaiming their own revelations, and this won them literally zero converts. Around this time, they started changing their names. They stopped being Marshall and Bonnie and became Bo and Peep. And then they started to go by guinea and pig as they started declaring themselves these holy test subjects. Uh, and then eventually the name they stuck with for a while was Doe and T, which is what they were both known at uh, at the end of their lives. And we're just going to keep referring to them as uh, Applewhite and Nettles for the sake of convenience. But they changed their name quite a bit. They were also known uh, really commonly, and we'll use this uh, 
a bit when talking about both of them. They started calling themselves the UFO 2 or just the 2. They called themselves soulmates and they were, as I mentioned, together almost constantly after they met, but their relationship was never sexual and the strict rejection of all sex was one of the strong shared beliefs that their relationship was built on. In 1974, Apple White was arrested for failing to return a rented car, which he claimed he had been given divine authorization to keep. The courts did not agree, and he was sentenced to six months in jail. And when he came out of jail, the theology of Heaven's Gate was finally solidified. It was at this point that the pair abandoned many of the contradictory New Age beliefs that Bonnie had brought in, and they settled definitively upon their very uh, sci-fi and extraterrestrial-themed interpretation of the King James Bible. Central to their new interpretation, they claimed that Jesus had been a representative of an alien race, and that his real message was obscured by metaphor that made it inaccessible to everyone but the chosen few. In their view, they and the chosen few who were capable of believing this message were also aliens and justified solely by faith in Jesus, just as in traditional Presbyterianism. This belief would allow them to discard their human existence and join the kingdom of heaven, which they claimed was a metaphor for a very real spaceship. From the mid-1970s on, they would remain almost reversed fundamentalists. Instead of believing that everything in the Bible was literally true, they said almost nothing in the Bible was literally true but was in fact a long allegory full of scientific instructions on how to physically ascend to heaven, which was a real place. They also uh, were an apocalyptic sect, believing that the apocalypse from the book of Revelations uh, was soon to occur, and that after the UFOs took them to heaven in the sci-fi themed version of the rapture, the earth would be, uh, in their language, recycled. Well, Bonnie and Marshall uh, changed their names quite a lot. They changed the name of their organization a number of times too. So again, we're calling them Heaven's Gate, but they didn't settle on that name for a while, and they went through a lot of name changes before that. But the first name that their group they formed went by is very revealing about their beliefs. It was originally called the Anonymous Sexaholic Celibate Church, which reflects one of their absolute obsessions, uh, particularly one that long dominated Apple White's life. He viewed all sexuality as a sin, which distracted people from heavenly goals, and would later infamously take that line of thought to the most extreme possible conclusion. After the cult eventually starts getting its first members beyond just the two, they would start going by names like the Total Overcomers, uh, Human Individual Metamorphosis, they went by for a long time, but most commonly they would just call themselves the Class. And in their last days, they would also got, go by a very darkly humorous uh, Star Trek reference, the Away Team. And that's one thing that's often missed in coverage of this group that really gets overshadowed by all the tragedy and absurdity is that they did have a little bit of a sense of humor about themselves. Um, they took this very, very seriously, as you might expect, but they still, they would joke around amongst themselves, uh, particularly with some of the Star Trek references. Um, they spent a lot of time together and there were just inside jokes that got built up and repeated too often into weird sort of jargon that just confused outsiders and especially once the media picks that up later uh, it just sounds really really absurd and most of the people reporting on this didn't really dig into it much but as sad and strange as this story gets i think it's really important to recognize that the people in this group weren't just brainwashed automatons as they're sometimes uh, described as they had their favorite tv shows they all love playing clue and they did have stupid jokes with their friends that they repeated way too often, uh, just as many of us do. Applewhite in particular was a huge Star Trek fan, and by the uh, 1980s he was using terminology lifted directly from the TV show in order to help get across some of his religious messages. The Trekkie phenomenon was taking off around the same time as Heaven's Gate was coming together, and eventually his connection would prove critical to gaining the group some of their converts. Well, Bonnie and Marshall, known around this time as the UFO 2, had already come up with their belief system. It was a short step for them to go from using Star Trek references as metaphors and jokes to claiming that Star Trek was literally true. Though, of course, most Trekkies had nothing to do with them, the message that was being preached uh, finally found a receptive audience started in the 1980s in Star Trek conventions. While cosplay, sci-fi conventions, and nerd and geek culture today have exploded to the point of being considered mainstream interests in a number of regards, in the 1970s, the old stereotypes of the antisocial nerd were a bit 
closer to reality uh, in the sense that you really didn't have representation of these interests in uh, mainstream in the forms of blockbuster Hollywood movies costumes every Halloween, things like that. If you were into interests of like science fiction television shows, hard sci-fi novels, things like that. There was a, there was a social stigma, essentially. Yeah, it wasn't um, it was different than it was today, definitely. Um, we need to keep that in mind, that these are people who are being ostracized for their interests already, and they're people who are really interested in digging deeper into these complicated uh, Star Trek mythologies in in putting themselves is where fan fiction starts being written really putting themselves into the story um, it was a big thing in the trekkie fandom as was the social isolation and stigma that went with it and this was a thread that heaven's gate managed to really tap into um, with a handful a very small handful of people but you can sort of see where the connections are there yeah because in the context of uh this sort of social environment T and Doe come along with their message that this fantastic sci-fi world is real and if you join them uh, then you're one of the elect so they offered people a community that accepted them for all of their strangeness and eccentricities they told them yes you are special you are smart uh, you feel like you don't fit in with society because you're better than them they're all just humans but you're an alien you don't belong here but you can leave this place. That kind of message resonated to various degrees with a lot of people who felt like outsiders. Uh, but through Heaven's Gate, those that felt that most strongly already were brought together, uh, where they pushed each other towards the more extreme conclusion of that line of thought. They also attended a lot of sex addict recovery meetings, offering desperate people a way to suppress their urges. Given what ends up happening later, there are quite a number of parallels in the media drawn to Jonestown and other cults, and there's a lot of talk about brainwashing. But we think it's a bit more subtle than that. Applewhite repeatedly talks about how members were, quote, free to leave at any time. And his recruitment videos, uh, where he spells out the beliefs of the cult, he mentions this several times, that he's aware of how bizarre it all sounds. Rather than attempting to convert the world, he stuck with his long-established view that his teachings were only for an exclusive elite, and the outlandish and bizarre nature of the claims were deliberately designed to weed out any who were not truly serious about their faith. Yeah, once the American public at large becomes familiar with Heaven's Gate, the immediate reaction is to dismiss them as insane and to mock their beliefs mercilessly. But this is a really interesting aspect of the story to me, since there's a strong us-versus-them mindset on both sides of that fence. Uh, after the tragedy eventually happens, the message uh, that most of America really takes to heart is this could never happen to normal people. And oddly enough, this could never happen to normal people is exactly Heaven's Gate's recruiting line and what they told themselves. Converts to the group finally began showing up in the late 70s, but right away the leaders would impose strict rules uh, to, as we said, weed out those who only had a casual interest in the group. Uh, the very strict control that cult members later lived under uh, was also largely self-imposed. While Heaven's Gate certainly proved to be a deadly cult, their tactics were less about convincing people they were correct and more about getting rid of converts who were too attached to the outside world. Over the decades, hundreds of people would join the many different versions of Heaven's Gate, and the vast majority of these people simply ended up leaving without incident as soon as they felt things were going too far. While this kept their numbers small, it also helped speed the group toward the extreme views and actions uh, that would later make them infamous. Here's a quote from one of the most famous researchers on Heaven's Gate, Robert Bulk. Uh, while undercover researching their practices in 1975, he noted, quote, the group's method of recruiting maximized the importance of belief as a reason for joining, while minimizing the importance of social bonds. Certainly nobody joined Heaven's Gate because they had made friends with members. There simply wasn't time for that. Rather, they joined because the belief system clicked. For some, it was eminently logical. For others, it just felt right, end quote. Heaven's Gate demanded total abstinence from sex, uh, from smoking marijuana, from staying in touch with old family members, and the two leaders really practice what they preach, which sets them apart from other infamous cult leaders like Jim Jones, who would 
impose a number of views upon those they converted while simultaneously breaking them in every instance that they got. While these leaders were absolutely fanatical and deeply troubled people in a number of regards, uh, they were not hypocrites. Their lifestyle evolved into one where all members of the cult lived together. They ate at the same time, they prayed at the same time, they went to work at the same time and watched TV and played board games at the same time. Most people in the class seemed to regard Applewhite and Nettles uh, like a combination of teachers and parents. The group lived out in the desert for a while before eventually moving through a whole series of rented houses in a bunch of different places in Texas throughout the 1980s. New members gave up their material possessions to join, deepening the feeling that there was nowhere else to go outside the cult. And these are, again, the, the serious members. Um, and as we mentioned, a lot of people were joining with a casual interest and then leaving really quickly. Throughout the 1970s and 80s, since they were preaching about a physical heaven, Applewhite and Nettles said that a physical body was needed in order to ascend to their heavenly reward. In 1987, though, Nettles somewhat unexpectedly died of liver cancer. I say somewhat unexpectedly because when the doctors told her she had cancer, she initially refused to believe that it was possible. So she and Applewhite thought that they would be together forever and that they would both die together and be taken up to space and that this would signal the start of the apocalypse as described in the book of Revelations. So she underwent no treatment whatsoever for her cancer and after a long and painful illness, she died in 1987. Applewhite was utterly shocked at her death. He considered her his teacher and best friend and soulmate. The elaborate myth that they had built up around themselves at this point was basically shattered. Uh, he was pretty devastated and continued preaching and running the cult on his own, but his response was to alter the beliefs of his cult significantly, and he would never really be the same again. After the death of Nettles, uh, he began to say that a body was no longer necessary to reach the kingdom of heaven, and he began to preach ominously about how the body and its sinful urges would not only be overcome, but actively discarded. Now, for those of our listeners who are more sensitive to the disturbing elements of uh, Heaven's Gate that you're no doubt at least partially aware of, we're going to start delving into them now. So this is your opportunity to tune out and join us for our next episode. But we will be delving in in full because doing so, we feel, is the historically responsible uh, thing to do. So it's hard to pin down exactly when it happened, but sometime after Bonnie's death, while Applewhite was still reeling emotionally and trying to restructure his whole worldview without her, um, a few cult members came to him for guidance. And they were having difficulty controlling their sexual urges, but they didn't want to leave, so they found a solution that they felt was biblically justified. The few who had discussed it amongst themselves wanted to use the cult's resources to pay for castrations down in Mexico. Applewhite was reportedly very against the idea at first, uh, because he was terrified that the families of these men would find out and claim that he had forced them into it. And at this point, he was also very, very paranoid about um, the government coming to get them, because uh, there was already, with, with Jonestown and all this uh, anti-cult sentiment across the country, very, very paranoid um, that they were being targeted by the government and he didn't want to give them excuses to crack down on them. But eventually he did change his mind, he did give permission, uh, and he later, fairly infamously, uh, would also get castrated himself for the same reasons. And several other members of this group would uh, undergo the same practice, but it was never uh, a mandatory thing, it was always something that they decided to do, that they really did feel would help them. Definitely, it's an extreme uh, step to take and definitely was something that uh, threw fuel out of the fire of seeing them as these, these bizarre, brainwashed, uh, sort of anonymous followers who would do everything that their cult leader said. But uh, that's a really inaccurate portrayal. It's, it's definitely not a case of these, these brainwashed people doing what he said. It's their own active contributions going up to him and him saying, yeah. So around the early 1990s, Heaven's Gate moved to California. And several members of the group started bringing in a lot of money working as web designers. This was the early 90s, and this was quite a yeah, lucrative line of work. Heaven's Gate itself ended up having what was, by 1990 standards, a pretty slick website. And this is where they really start recruiting through the internet, which is something that a lot of uh, extremist sects today try and do. The money from their computer consulting firm also allowed the whole cult to settle into a large and comfortable house in a private and upscale gated neighborhood in San Diego, California. This new building allowed them a lot of space and a lot of privacy, 
and was also an excellent spot for stargazing because there wasn't a lot of light pollution. In this time period, the group starts building up even more of a following, and there's a lot of uh, materials written and a lot of videos shot by them intended to get their message out that they send out through their website, uh, and a lot of these are in fact still floating around out there on the web. And once they had this house, they stopped their semi-nomadic lifestyle that they'd had up until this point, and they went pretty far in separating themselves more and more from the rest of the world. They dressed in matching uniforms, they stuck to the same strict schedules, they traveled only in groups unless they absolutely had to go off alone, and constantly encouraged each other to focus on learning and perfecting themselves, preparing to evolve beyond the human state into what they call the next level or the evolutionary level above human. There's a lot of reports about them from random people in their neighborhood that were interviewed about them once the media swarmed on this uh, location. The stories tend to be about seeing uh, members of Heaven's Gate around town, traveling in groups, dressing identically with their matching shaved heads, and a lot of people mention them being very polite but mostly only speaking to each other um, and doing a lot of praying. If these reports are accurate, most of their neighbors seem to think that they were strange but harmless. In 1995, astronomers spotted Hale Bop, a very rare uh, comet the likes of which wouldn't be seen for another 200 years. Word began buzzing in the UFO enthusiast communities about mysterious specks picked up on camera in the wake of the comet. And when the rumors reached Heaven's Gate, Abelwhite decided this was exactly the sign he'd been waiting for since the death of Nettles 13 years earlier. Proclaiming that the comet signaled bodies returned to Earth and that the time had at last arrived, Heaven's Gate slowly and methodically prepared for what many of them viewed as their final test of faith, their final removal from a doomed planet, the confirmation of their own superiority as the chosen few. The events at Jonestown and Waco, Texas, which I'm sure we'll cover in future episodes, were well known to the members of Heaven's Gate, and like both of those other sects, uh, they had a deep fear of the government coming to wipe them out, and after Waco especially, Heaven's Gate rewrote their belief structure uh, to specifically state that being killed by government persecution was one way to enter the Kingdom of Heaven. Another way to enter the Kingdom of Heaven, though, was the way they eventually pursued, and the one that would bring them to national prominence. On Heaven's Gate website, one of their prominent pages is our position against suicide. In it, they talk about their fears that the quote-unquote powers that be could come to incinerate them like in Waco. They talk about how the last days of the Earth are coming and how it would be suicide to remain on the Earth. They prepared a lot of materials in the lead-up to what they euphemistically called graduation for the class. Uh, in their writings and in their videotapes, the various members of Heaven's Gate individually explain their own personal reasons for what they're about to do. The transcripts of these are easier to get through than the tapes, but even these are really hard to read. Um, just emotionally uh, difficult, as you might imagine. The writers all have their own things to say. They repeat a lot of the same core beliefs and sayings, but they all have their own opinions, their own paths that led them there. Uh, and their own reasons for believing what they believed and making the choice that they were about to make. The personal messages of the members of Weapons Gate all made it really clear that they thought this decision through and they all thought that they were making the right one. Wayne Cook, a member of Heaven's Gate who had left the group shortly before this, did report that there's a lot of infighting over various things, that some of the members were looking more towards the money they were making and not looking at their purpose, and there was a lot of dispute over this. But then, ultimately, all those who stayed came to the same conclusion. In the explosion of media attention that they're about to get, there's a lot of talk about how, oh, they're all crazy, or oh, they're all brainwashed, but uh, real life is more complicated than that, and uh, I think it's a lot easier to dismiss a tragedy than try and understand it. Uh, Marshall Applewhite in particular, as the leader of the cult, gets a lot of focus, obviously, but a lot of the media narrative is driven by he brainwashed these people who didn't know what they were doing. Over the course of three days in late March of 1996, 39 members of Heaven's Gate committed ritualistic suicide by a combination of drug overdose and asphyxiation. They did this in two groups of 15 on each of the first two days, with a group of nine, including Applewhite, on the last day. They viewed this as the final test of their faith, and that by abandoning their human bodies, they would be reborn in new bodies, back with Bonnie Nettles, who had been elevated beyond human, and then come back for them. At some point, the banner announcement of their website had changed to read, Red Alert, Hail Bop brings closure to Heaven's Gate. The bodies were discovered by police on March 26th, after they had been rotting for several days. 
Reporters swarmed to the house quickly, and news reports of the horrific scene were quickly broadcast across the country. The bodies were all under purple shrouds, and their matching shoes all clearly showed the instantly recognizable Nike swoosh logo. There was also another display of the habit of Heaven's Gate to make what in retrospect are some very dark inside jokes. Whenever a member of Heaven's Gate had gone on a trip outside, uh, they were supposed to carry three quarters for making calls home on a payphone and a five dollar bill to pay the fee in case the police arrested them for vagrancy. Found on every body in the compound was five dollars and seventy-five cents. The outlandish beliefs of this cult were quickly used to turn them from a national tragedy into a national laughingstock. Less than three weeks after his death, Marshall Applewhite was played by Will Ferrell in the opening sketch of Saturday Night Live. Well, this whole killing yourself thing has really turned out to be a home run for you. Tell me, are there any regrets? Yeah, the castration thing. <laughs> I was way off on that one, Dad. Saturday Night Live continued making fun of Heaven's Gate uh, with another sketch later on parodying the Nike ad campaign that they had spent uh, quite a lot of money getting the rights to Beatles songs for. The next SNL sketch just uh, showed footage of the discovery of the bodies of Heaven's Gate with the uh, Beatles song that Nike had paid for the rights for playing over it and then ended with a statement in support of a different shoe company. Nike did release a brief statement uh, after this occurred, uh, and there was an article in Ad Week in 1997 called An Endorsement Nike Didn't Want. Uh, in this, the Nike spokesperson says very briefly, we've all heard the jokes, the Heaven's Gate incident was a tragedy. It had nothing to do with Nike. An NBC representative at the time reported, we have not had any feedback, positive or negative, from viewers, affiliates, or advertisers regarding our parody, which is something that I don't think would happen today. On May 7th, 1997, San Diego Sheriff's officials discovered two men wearing black Nikes with the swoosh and the purple shrouds uh, in a Hollywood Inn hotel room. One of them was Wayne Cook, the member of Heaven's Gate who uh, reported the infighting who had left shortly before the mass suicide. Um, he had committed suicide the exact same method and both of the people in the room had $5.75 in their pockets. The second man, however, survived the suicide attempt. His name was Charles Humphreys, and he later gave an interview talking about his experience and talked about possibly writing a memoir. However, less than a year later, Humphreys was also found dead in a car of carbon monoxide poisoning. He was wearing, again, a purple shroud, head in his pocket, $5.75, and wore the armband, saying Heaven's Gate away team. As we noted, Heaven's Gate went far out of their way to emphasize their separateness from humanity, which to them was a point of pride. Still, the speed with which mainstream society went from mourning uh, to mocking them strikes us as uh, somewhat unseemly. Stories about Heaven's Gate shifted from reporting on the tragedy to holding their most outlandish beliefs and terrifying self-inflicted sufferings up for general ridicule. They became one more cautionary tale about evil cults lumped in with Jonestown and the Manson family, but, but this one was the scary cult that it was okay to laugh at. Uh, their complicated mythology and beliefs were reduced down to sound bites, then to punchlines. Today, interest in Heaven's Gate is fairly low, and those who remember them tend not to remember much beyond the aliens, the comet, the Nike shoes, and the mass suicide. Their website, nevertheless, has stayed up, still bearing their final update from 1997. Hale Bop brings closure to Heaven's Gate. It can be seen at www.heavensgate.com. Thank you for joining us on another episode of Sex Ed. To keep informed about all our future episodes, be sure to follow us on Facebook and Twitter, at Sex Ed with a CTS. You can also subscribe to us on iTunes, and don't forget to leave us a rating. We love to hear your feedback. And be sure to also tell a friend, because word of mouth is the quickest way that our podcast can grow. If you have questions, comments, suggestions for future episodes, you can reach us also uh, by email at sexed at gmail.com. This episode of Sex Ed was researched, written, produced, and presented by Michael Albany and Patrick Reynolds, and was edited by Patrick Reynolds. Sex Ed is created under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. It was recorded at Leader, the lab for the education and advancement in digital research at Michigan State University. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily represent those of
of Michigan State University or any of its affiliates.